And I'd also like to single out our Georgetown India Dialogue Student Initiative and colleagues from our Asian Studies program and the School of Foreign Service for having put together such a wonderful program this afternoon and for bringing us together for this event. Georgetown, as many of you know, is the oldest Catholic and Jesuit university in the United States. We're an institution with strong expertise and robust networks around international issues. And as an institution, we're committed to promoting greater understanding and collaboration in the service of the global common good. Our Washington, D.C. location gives us an opportunity to convene events like this one, to bring together distinguished foreign visitors, faculty and students, members of the diplomatic and wider D.C. communities. The Kashmir Conclave is part of our wider, expanding effort here at Georgetown to deepen understanding of India within the United States and to contribute to better ties, stronger ties between our two great nations. There's no one better to provide perspective on our topic, Kashmir, the way forward, than our keynote speaker, Omar Abdullah. Mr. Abdullah is former chief minister of Jammu and Kashmir. He just completed a six-year term as the youngest chief minister in the history of the state. He's a current member of the state's legislative assembly and also serves as the working president of the National Conference Party. Among many other distinctions of his career in public service, Mr. Abdullah has served as union minister of state for external affairs, a position he held in the national government in 2001 and 2002. You are an accomplished politician and an astute observer of public affairs in India and South Asia. I'm honored that you're here with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Omar. Thank you very much for that, uh, for those warm words of welcome. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, uh, may I begin by confessing to a fair degree of nervousness <laughs> at being here today uh, in amongst such an accomplished audience at a university as famous as Georgetown. This is the first time I've had the opportunity of visiting any American university. And the fact that the first university in America I'm visiting is, is Georgetown uh, is something I consider myself uh, fortunate for. The fact that we are here to discuss Jammu and Kashmir uh, is a matter of, of I think considerable disappointment uh, on, at a personal level for me because 25 years into militancy in Jammu and Kashmir and uh, decades since India and Pakistan were formed, we are still discussing the issue of Jammu and Kashmir. I had hoped long before this that the issue would have been put to rest and that we'd be discussing a whole lot of other things with regard to India, Pakistan, the neighborhood, but not Jammu and Kashmir. But here we are, uh, 2015, uh, Georgetown is having uh, a, a conclave, and it's about uh, Jammu and Kashmir. Now for me to be able to talk to you about the future prospects, uh, I would have to talk to you a bit about how we got to uh, where we did in 1990. Jammu and Kashmir only really came into the international uh, thought process once militancy broke out in Jammu and Kashmir uh, and it started to be described by various uh, presidents here and, and other uh, influential people as the most dangerous place in the world. Uh, I dare say perhaps if at one point in time it might have been, uh, it certainly isn't today, but we'll come to that later. I will, as I said, touch upon some of the, uh, the issues pertaining to the history of Jammu and Kashmir, its accession, the tenuous relationship between uh, Jammu and Kashmir and uh, the rest of India, 
and uh, India-Pakistan relationship. But I'm hoping we'll be able to get into the more substantive uh, parts of it and, and perhaps more details on some of these things when we get into the discussion and the question and answer. So in the initial remarks, I'll just touch on some of these to try and put uh, the past into, into some perspective. Jammu and Kashmir, uh, for various reasons, uh, is seen as critical uh, by both India and Pakistan uh, to certify the choices that they made in 1947 uh, when both countries came into existence uh, for very different reasons. Jammu and Kashmir being a Muslim majority state, uh, Pakistan felt it should naturally have been a part of Pakistan. Uh, but being a Muslim majority state uh, with a number of other population uh, groups, no, uh, of course Hindus being the largest amongst them, but a size of the population of Sikhs, Buddhists and Christians, of course India felt that Jammu and Kashmir symbolizes what India was supposed to be about, which was a pluralistic, secular society. And therefore Jammu and Kashmir being a part of India was a natural extension of what India was going to be about. Now in 1947, uh, when uh, partition took place, three states gave uh, the young India trouble. They were the states of Junagadh, the state of Hyderabad, and the state of Jammu and Kashmir, uh, for very different reasons. Uh, Jammu and Kashmir, because it was a Muslim majority state ruled by a Hindu leader, Junagadh and Hyderabad, because they were Hindu majority states ruled by Muslim leaders. And therefore, when the princely states had to decide which countries they would opt for, Hyderabad and Junagadh, their leadership <coughs> opted for Pakistan, which was uh, an untenable arrangement because you couldn't have bits of Pakistan in the heart of India. Jammu and Kashmir did not decide. Uh, the Maharaja said, well, hang on, I'm not in a position to decide. I want time to be able to make up my mind. And therefore, on the 15th of August 1947, when India and Pakistan uh, parted ways and, and came into existence, Jammu and Kashmir was neither a part of India nor a part of Pakistan. It was an independent entity, uh, an independent uh, kingdom, so to speak. Now, ideally, the Maharaja would have been given all the time he needed to make up his mind. Which way he would have gone, uh, nobody could tell. You had, as I said, Hindu majority states where the, the, uh, the Nizam or the ruler decided to go with Pakistan but because they were Hindu majority states they uh, assimilated into India. Here you had a Muslim majority state with a Hindu ruler who said well hang on we need to time to make up our minds. In the meantime Pakistan invaded uh, tribal raiders. Uh, how much of them, how many of them were actually tribal raiders, how many of them were mainstream Pakistani forces, I don't know. But the fact is that Pakistan invaded parts of Jammu and Kashmir and those parts continue to be occupied by Pakistan uh, even as we speak today. Now, at that point, the Maharaja reached out to the government of India for help. The government of India said, yes, fine, we'll help, but you will have to exceed. And, and we can't send our armies to an independent country to help you. We can only send our armies to a part of our own country. So the Maharaja signed an instrument of accession. Jammu and Kashmir became a part of India. The Indian army moved in, uh, stopped the tribal raiders in their, in, their, in their tracks, started to push them back, and push them back a fair distance. At which point in time, uh, the United Nations Security Council got involved. And uh, both India and Pakistan represented to the, uh, to the United Nations Security Council resolution. And this is the important part, one of the, the first points I want to make here. Traditionally, and I don't understand why this has happened, India has been extremely apologetic about its history in Jammu and Kashmir and about the fact that the people of Jammu and Kashmir did not get to choose, so to speak, as to which side they would want to go with. The so-called plebiscite that was promised to the people of Jammu and Kashmir didn't happen. Now the problem is that more often than not you would hear the Pakistanis blaming India saying that this was a plebiscite that India did not allow to take place. But unfortunately, the people making that allegation or, or having arrived at that conclusion, okay, I can understand in the good old days before Google and all the rest of it, coming across these documents was a little bit difficult. But now, 
The same way I've accessed those documents, I'm sure they could have as well. All you have to do is open up a browser, type in United Nations Security Council Resolution JNK, and the first thing that comes up is the text of the United Nations Security Council Resolution number 47 of 1948, which lays down the, uh, the, 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 uh, the roadmap for normalizing the situation in Jammu and Kashmir. And in that, the first responsibility rests on Pakistan to do everything within its power to remove its nationals, whether in uniform or out of uniform, from the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Following on from that, not at the same time, following on from that, the onus passes on to the government of India to then start scaling down its true presence in Jammu and Kashmir to a manageable level that can be worked out, allowing for a minimum number of troops and security forces to be present there to maintain law and order so that a plebiscite can take place and the people can be allowed to choose. Now quite clearly, the first step was never taken. Therefore, the second step never followed on. So for decades, together, somehow we have allowed the narrative to shift from what was primarily Pakistan's responsibility to what India is being held responsible for. Since then, uh, a lot of water has flown <coughs> through the Jhelum or whichever river you care to name. Clearly, uh, what was possible in 1948 is not possible today for various reasons. I, I, one of the main reasons is that the Pakistani side of Jammu and Kashmir no longer resembles the Jammu and Kashmir that it was in 47-48. In terms of territory, Pakistan has ceded territory to China. I don't think they're in a position to take that territory back. In terms of population mix as well, while India has been uh, very careful not to alter the population mix of Jammu and Kashmir, as in they've not injected non-state subjects into the state, Pakistan has had no such qualms about changing the ethnic mix of their side of Jammu and Kashmir. And therefore, were hypothetically a plebiscite to be offered tomorrow, the people voting on the Pakistani side <coughs> would largely be non-state subjects, and in some cases, in the areas ceded to China, would be completely disenfranchised anyway. Uh, they wouldn't have a choice. And therefore, more often than not, when you hear Pakistan talking about a plebiscite, they very conveniently point only towards the part of Jammu and Kashmir that is with India, uh, conveniently forgetting that there is a part of Jammu and Kashmir that lies with them as well. And uh, uh, that's, that's sort of a logo area uh, not to be talked about. So that's, that's the first thing. The whole dynamic around accession, the United Nations Security Council resolution, and what it actually means, as opposed to how it has been interpreted as as uh, time has gone on. Then we come to accession itself. Now, I think it's important to understand that while other princely states first acceded to India and then merged into India, Jammu and Kashmir is the only state that only acceded; it did not merge. We have an instrument of accession but we have no instrument of merger. There is no merger that took place, which means that Jammu and Kashmir cannot be treated at par with other states. When Jammu and Kashmir joined the rest of India, it did so under very uh, clearly laid down terms and conditions uh, in the instrument of accession, which detailed what government of India was to be responsible for and what uh, the state government was to be responsible for. And in that, only four items were at the uh, at, uh, were, uh, the government of India's responsibility. Currency, communication, defense, and foreign affairs. Everything else was the domain of the state. And therefore, those who would suggest that uh, Jammu and Kashmir should be treated no differently from the rest of the country, and that Jammu and Kashmir should not have any special status, forget that it is on the back of this special status that Jammu and Kashmir actually became a part of India. And therefore, to suggest that Jammu and Kashmir has to be treated the same as all the other states flies in the face of the very discussions and the very instrument of accession that made 
Jammu and Kashmir a part of India. Now, obviously, over time, that special status has eroded. Uh, various things took place that uh, called into question uh, the government of India's and, and large Indian political parties' commitment to democracy in Jammu and Kashmir. You had the arrest, the overthrow subsequent arrest of the then Prime Minister of Jammu and Kashmir in 1953. You had uh, a similar situation with the breakdown of, of the accord between uh, the National Conference and the Congress in the late 70s. You had the use of the Governor's Office to overthrow a democratically elected government in 84. You had all the problems associated with the elections of 87, with the, with the, with the allegations of electoral malpractices. And over time, uh, you basically convinced the people of Jammu and Kashmir that their point of view didn't matter. That no matter who they elected, if the person they elected to office did not bow before the powers that be in Delhi, they would soon be gotten rid of and a more pliable administration would be installed there. With this, you had, of course, Pakistan's growing involvement in the region. I still believe that militancy in Pakistan was a laboratory to test their systems to see how they would, to fine tune them. Not because they had their eye on Pakistan, but because they wanted to wait for the right, right circumstances to recreate Punjab in Jammu and Kashmir. And that is exactly what happened. If you see, as the graph of militancy in Jammu and Kashmir goes up, the militancy graph in Punjab goes down. Now, I know there are those who would like to give credit for the eradication of militancy in Punjab to A by ABC or XYZ. I believe that while they did play an important part in this, the largest part in this was played by the fact that Pakistan basically gave up. They, they lost interest in, in militancy in Punjab. They lost interest in supporting the cause of, of Khalistan and an independent uh, country. As far as they were concerned, uh, the systems had been put into place, lessons had been learned. Jammu and Kashmir, post the elections of 1987 and the festering resentment uh, that was there amongst the youngsters was, was ripe for the, the sort of uh, lessons that they had learned. They injected militancy into, into Jammu and Kashmir and that was the, the beginning of, of the steep uh, slope downwards, which is where today, uh, in 2015, we are still discussing Jammu and Kashmir. Militancy in, in, in Jammu and Kashmir has had a number of, of very tragic facets, uh, not the least of which has been the almost complete uh, exodus of the Kashmiri Pandit community from Jammu and Kashmir, something we are reading uh, under even today, uh, in spite of the best efforts uh, of successive governments, both at the center and at the state, other than a symbolic return uh, for some who have uh, taken up uh, government jobs, there really hasn't been much uh, in, 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 in the shape of, of the return of Kashmiri pundits, but that's something I'll come to uh, as, as we go ahead. Human rights has been a huge matter of concern uh, in Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, the way in which security forces from time to time are functioned uh, with a sense of complete immunity from prosecution or any sort of action uh, being taken against them for excessive use of force has been something that has put India on the back foot a uh, number of times uh, in the past. I dare say the situation is markedly better today than it has been in the past, but even today incidents do take place and that is why you will find that political parties, particularly those that don't have uh, a presence outside of Jammu and Kashmir will continue to press for the removal of those laws uh, that are in place in Jammu and Kashmir that give the security forces this immunity uh, from prosecution under the civil courts. Democratic and governance institutions almost completely disappeared. Political parties were one of the primary targets of uh, militancy. The party that I have come to head has lost people in the thousands. Uh, a, a, a large section of our cadre has been almost completely wiped out. And uh, this was done simply because parties like mine did not see the solution to the Kashmir issue beyond 
1953, which is the point at which Jammu and Kashmir enjoyed a special status within the Indian Union. Uh, these people who targeted the National Conference would have preferred the National Conference to have looked for a solution that extended beyond 1947 and called into question the accession of Jammu and Kashmir uh, to the rest of India, which we weren't willing to do. So political parties suffered, institutions of governance suffered. Obviously, with the primary focus being on restoration of normality, on uh, controlling the outbreak of militancy, everything else took a back seat. Uh, so, whether it was development, whether it was accountability, whether it was education, whether it was health, all of it fell by the wayside. And I often quote these examples of, of how difficult it was in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the bad old days of militancy just for the average Kashmiri to survive there. And I'll, I'll give you this example. You know, today, uh, none of us think twice about getting up in the morning and putting on our watch before we leave the house. But there was a time in the early 90s where wearing a watch could be a matter of life or death for a person. Because the militants decreed that Jammu and Kashmir was not a part of India and therefore did not fall within the Indian time zone. And so watches should not be set to Indian standard time, they should be set to Pakistan standard time. Of course, the security forces would have nothing of it. Jammu and Kashmir was an integral part of India, therefore the time that prevailed in Delhi was the time that prevailed in Jammu and Kashmir. Now, depending upon who stopped you and asked you the time, if you didn't give the right answer, you would have it. So if it was a plain clothes police guy who was doing a random check on a bus, decided to ask you what the time is, and you gave the time with a half an hour difference, which was the time in Islamabad, that was it. You, 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 could, you could forget about going home that evening to see your family. And, and the same is true for, for if it was a, a militant asking you what the time was. So, more often than not, people stopped wearing watches. Vehicles, what vehicle you drove, if that was a vehicle that was popular with the security forces, forget it. Even signboards. I mean, I think Jammu and Kashmir must have been the only place where Coca-Cola as a signboard was painted in green and white and not red and white. Because those were the colors decreed as, as uh, in keeping with the more Islamic line that they wanted. So every signboard in Jammu and Kashmir had to be in green and white. So every houseboat, every shop, every billboard, everything was painted in, in those colors. That's sort of where Jammu and Kashmir was in the early 90s. If you were to visit Jammu and Kashmir now, yes, you will see a higher percentage of security forces on the streets than perhaps in a lot of other parts of the country. But you will see a far more Jammu and Kashmir than you would have done in the last 20, 25 years. Now, now that we know where we are, we know how we got here. This is the easy part. Where do we go from here? What are the challenges and what are the ways forward? Well, clearly, we have established that a solution to Jammu and Kashmir is not going to emerge out of violence. It's not going to emerge out of war, and it's not going to emerge out of terrorism. India and Pakistan have fought three and a half wars. Nothing has changed on the ground for Jammu and Kashmir. 25 years of militancy in Jammu and Kashmir, countless deaths, but not an inch of territory has moved either towards the west or towards the east. And therefore, if violence is not the way forward, clearly that only leaves the avenue of dialogue. And that's part of the problem. Dialogue in Jammu and Kashmir has been more start than stop. Sorry, more stop than start. It's been a very erratic process of engagement, both internationally and domestically. Jammu and Kashmir is not going to be resolved just a dialogue between New Delhi and Islamabad. There is as much for New Delhi to discuss with Islamabad as there is for New Delhi to discuss with Srinagar and for Islamabad to discuss with Muzaffarabad, which is the capital of Jammu and Kashmir, that is with, uh, with Pakistan. Uh, various names, Pakistan occupied Kashmir, Pakistan administered Kashmir, Azad Kashmir, depending upon where you sit, uh, 
you, you, you sort of use those words. So I normally play safe and say the part of Jammu Kashmir that is with Pakistan is it's less offensive uh, all, all around. But yeah, so I mean, it, it requires a sustained dialogue in, 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 in each of these, these areas, which hasn't happened. There have been the beginnings of dialogues, whether it was between uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee and uh, Nawaz Sharif, which resulted in the Lahore Bus Yatra, followed soon after by the Kargil War. We've had uh, dialogue between Nawaz Sharif, between uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee and uh, Musharraf, Agra being, uh, being, being, I think, the biggest example of that. You had a dialogue at various points in time between Dr. Manmohan Singh and first uh, Musharraf, then Zakari, then uh, Nawaz Sharif. But every time dialogue starts, something happens to it. And therefore, one of the challenges is going to be how do you keep a sustained dialogue going in spite of the fact that there will be people around that who want to derail their dialogue process. Please understand, there is a huge vested interest that has built up on both sides of the border and line of control in keeping this problem in Jammu Kashmir alive. It would be very easy for me to stand up here and say it's only the Pakistanis that want the Kashmir issue to remain alive. But honestly, trust me, there is a vested interest on how much we can we can we can argue the numbers. But let's not uh, let's let's not kid ourselves that there is no vested interest on the part on, on the Indian side in keeping, uh, in, or at least in sections of it, in keeping the issue of Jammu and Kashmir alive. Surprisingly enough, if you look at the two most recent elections, national elections in Pakistan and in India, if you see the tone and tenor of the campaign, Jammu and Kashmir was more of an issue in the Indian election than it was in the Pakistani election. In fact, I don't recall any of the major political parties, whether it was Nawaz Sharif, Zagaris, or Imran Khan's, actually making an issue out of Jammu and Kashmir in their general election. But you only have to look back at, at uh, uh, our own election uh, what, seven, eight months ago, and, and you would have seen how much Jammu and Kashmir was a part of, of, of the narrative in, in that election. So it's not just the Pakistanis that use Jammu and Kashmir for, for political purposes. As I said, occasionally something happens, stands get hardened, we step back from the dialogue process and it becomes very difficult to re-engage. Uh, and so post-parliament attack, it took us forever to, to re-engage and then start talking again. Post-2611, the same thing happened. Post the beheading of our soldiers on the border, we stepped back, same thing happened. And, and I mean, recent history is, is, is full of examples where we've had situations like this. The internal dialogue is, is the same. Every government has had some sort of engagement with the separatists uh, at various levels. The previous BJP-led government of uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee actually had the separatists engaging at the level of the Deputy Prime Minister. They had a cup of tea with the then Prime Minister. Uh, you've had uh, separatists engaging with the previous government at the level of Mr. Chidambaram, who was Home Minister. Uh, it was uh, supposed to be a very quiet dialogue until we read about it on the front pages of the Hindu newspaper and that put an end uh, to that dialogue. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the challenge is how do you, you keep a sustained dialogue going both internally as well as externally? How do you deliver on expectations? One of the biggest problems has been that with every election there is a heightened sense of expectation and that heightened sense of expectation leads to disappointment. The fact is, I'm talking to you here, not as Chief Minister of Jammu and Kashmir, but as a leader in the opposition and an MLA, because I lost the last election. I lost the last elections because clearly the, 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 the expectations that people had from me uh, after the elections in 2008 weren't realized over the six years that I was in office. And I dare say the same thing is going to happen to the government that has come after me. And it's not something I'm particularly disappointed about. Uh, but, uh, the sooner that happens, the better. But no, but seriously, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's all very well for me to, 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 to look forward to that. But no, the problem is, every time you raise expectations only to dash them, it becomes that much more difficult to get people to identify themselves with the process. 
And every time you tell them, they look, okay, this election is going to result in A, B, C, D, E, and it doesn't. It becomes that much more difficult to convince them the next time around to put their lives on the line and come and participate in an election that doesn't deliver on its promises. And therefore, I think regardless of, of uh, how much politically I need uh, this current state government to fail, as a regular citizen of the state of Jammu and Kashmir, I truly hope that they actually do deliver on some of their promises. Because we need to show people in these elections that, that it's not all about disappointment. That yes, okay, out of a hundred things, we won't deliver all hundred. But we certainly can aspire to deliver fifty out of them. The disappointment sets in when, when we don't even touch the halfway point. Uh, so that's that's an area. How do we economically stabilize Jammu and Kashmir? Jammu and Kashmir is hugely dependent on the government of India. I mean, I, I, would, I would quote figures for you here. My problem is that in my head, those figures are all in rupees. And, and I, uh, I, I, I don't have the ability to translate those or, or convert them into dollars, therefore it probably not make sense to a lot of you. So I'll just say that, I mean, Jammu and Kashmir, in, in terms of just the salary bill for government employees, we don't make enough money in the state to pay for our own government servants, let alone start paying for development activities. So that, I mean, how do we stabilize the economy? How do we make it less dependent on the center? There is a wealth of resources available. Yes, we don't have iron ore, we don't have coal, we don't have gold, we don't have all that. But we do have A, a lot of natural beauty that allows us uh, to, to attract tourism, something that has started uh, reviving uh, in recent years. But we have a lot of potential for hydroelectricity. I truly believe that if we're going to turn the state economy around, Jammu and Kashmir has to become surplus in generation of electricity so we can sell that electricity in the rest of the country and use that money to shore up the finances of the state. Now for that again, uh, some amount of assistance is going to have to come from the government of India. I've seen that the, 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 the current state government has promised that this is what they're going to do. We'll have to wait and see. <coughs> I talked about the Kashmiri pundits uh, and how their uh, departure, uh, their exodus, was one of the, 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 the uh, sort of darkest periods of, of the onset of militancy. One of the challenges going ahead is how do we start convincing them to come back? Uh, I, 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 I do not believe that they will come back in the numbers that left. 25 years is a very, very long time for people to establish roots elsewhere. But they want, they, they want to know and they need to know that they can come back. Now there are various models that are doing the rounds. I've been critical of the most recent proposal, which is to establish sort of encampments and, and townships uh, within the valley. Because I believe that if you really want to bring Jammu Kashmir back to what it was pre-militancy, you can't have individual sort of uh, islands of population, that this little township is a Hindu township, this township is a Sikh township, this township is a Muslim township. Currently, whatever population is living, is living sort of in close proximity to each other. It's, it's an ongoing dialogue. I know that there are a, a, a large number of people within the Kashmiri Malik community that would like to see this dialogue taken forward, but it is going to be a challenge. How do we convince the Kashmiri Malik community to come back? How do we restore their sense of security? Because they left because their sense of security was snatched away from them. We have to restore that sense of security back to them. So, the way forward, how do we resolve the problem? Greater minds than mine have attempted to answer this question uh, with almost no success. Uh, this problem has festered since Nehru and Jinnah with the respective leaders of their countries and Many have come and gone after that. But I think one thing is, is certain. Status quo is not the answer on either side. If India is going to continue to maintain that the parts of Jammu and Kashmir that are occupied by Pakistan have to be vacated and until then there will be no solution. And if Pakistan continues to insist that Jammu and Kashmir is the unfinished agenda of the partition of 1947, then we're going through that. For any solution to work, I think we first have to recognize that there can be no further 
transfer of territory between either of the two countries. Which means that you take the line of control and recognize it as a border. Now I do understand that this is going to be hugely difficult to sell in either India or Pakistan. But I can't, to the best of my imagination, come up with a more viable solution that over time can start to work. And please understand, we ourselves have recognized this line of control when we had every reason not to. Please go back to as recently as 1998, the Kargil War. If India had wanted to, they could have crossed the line of control. They could have started to retake territories that are occupied by Pakistan. We didn't even let our fighter planes cross the line of control when we had to shell positions held by Pakistan. We lost soldiers and we lost pilots because it was carved in stone for them that you will not cross the line of control under any circumstances. So in a period of conflict, if we recognize the line of control as the line that was not to be crossed, I think we've kind of sent out a message that this is something that, that can form a part of an overall solution. As I said, it's not going to be an easy sell, but I'd like somebody then to propose an alternative to me because I don't see any other alternative that requires either India or Pakistan to lose face actually working. Now I can be thinking and say, well, I don't care whether the Pakistanis lose face or not if we win. But come on, let's be honest, it's the same sort of voices that we on the Pakistani side saying, look, I don't care if India has to lose face as long as we win. And if both are interested in keeping face, then nobody wins. At least of all the people of Jammu and Kashmir who have lived through all this for, for the last how many decades. So that's, that's one. If you do recognize the line of control, uh, finally, then it has to be a soft it has to allow for people to move more freely, for goods to move more freely. And I think it can be an example for the rest of the neighborhood. We aspire towards a South Asian free trade area. It's something that all the countries in the region have committed to. And certainly, you can start from Jammu and Kashmir and move onwards from there. We all use Europe as an example about us as to how easy it has become to move from one country to another, to work in one country, live in another. As I said, there is a, there is a, a paper built around SAFTA, the South Asian Free Trade Area, which, which can be allowed to work. So, yeah, free movement of, of people and goods, that's on the international side. Internally, we need to recognize, as I said right at the beginning, Jammu and Kashmir exceeded to India. It didn't merge with India. And therefore, we need to recognize Jammu and Kashmir's special status within the Indian Union. The fact is that only one side of the deal has been kept. Jammu and Kashmir continues to remain a part of India. But the agreement has been watered down. So basically, the people of Jammu and Kashmir have got a boundary. They've been sold something. But over time, what they've sold has gradually sort of eroded, shrunk. So while they were sold a state that would be a part of India, but would be unique in as much as it would only be, uh, the government of India would only be responsible for four things. Today, you have a situation where uh, that, that has been weaned away to what it is now. And therefore, a sustained dialogue to restore the special status of Jammu and Kashmir. I agree, you cannot turn the clock back to what it was pre-1953. You can't have a situation where some of the important institutions uh, that are now applicable in Jammu and Kashmir are, are suddenly removed. You can't have a situation where the Supreme Court of India suddenly doesn't have jurisdiction over, it, uh, over Jammu and Kashmir. Or the Election Commission of India doesn't have jurisdiction. I and mean, who will believe an election in Jammu and Kashmir if we manage it ourselves? Nobody will. If I was the Chief Minister of Jammu and Kashmir as a result of an election that I've organized myself, you guys would throw me out of here laughing. So there are institutions that lend credibility and, and add value uh, to the state. But that's all part of a discussion process. 
we give in on one, uh, take something else on another, and try and restore some element of that special status that Jammu Kashmir had. The Armed Forces Special Powers Act, that law that gives that immunity to security forces, needs to be looked at and, and soon. Levels of violence are almost 80% lower than what they were in the year 2000. Yet nothing has changed in terms of these laws that apply. There are vast areas of the state of Jammu and Kashmir now where militancy is almost unknown. But these laws are still applicable. And therefore, a rethink on areas from which this law can be removed I think is essential. At the same time, reducing the security force footprint is also vital. There's far too much camouflage uh, uniform in, 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 sort of in, in plain sight there. It needs to replace, be replaced gradually with, with, with police and the army put back to what it does best, which is to, to look after the frontiers and, and the borders. I've talked about the, the question of, of the Kashmiri pundits and how we take that forward. I think, finally, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission should be established. <coughs> there are far too many unanswered questions about what has happened in the last 25 years that I believe the people of Jammu Kashmir deserve an answer to. The whole issue of the half-widows, women whose husbands went across the line of control and haven't come back and haven't been a men who disappeared after having been taken to interrogation centers and security force camps, uh, the targeted killings of uh, mainstream political workers, the, the functioning of, of camps, training camps in Pakistan. I dare say uh, people must have died in those camps as well that are unaccounted for today. And the onus of that, of that is put on India, that you guys made these people disappear. The whole question of the unmarked graves, uh, who are, 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 have been laid to rest in those graves, what are their origins? I think that there are any number of questions about the last 20, 25 years that need to be answered, but they can't be answered only by one side. I'm often asked this, well, if you want a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, you were Chief Minister for six years, why didn't you set one up? But for a lot of these questions, the answers aren't in Jammu Kashmir. For a lot of these questions, the answers are on the other side of the line the other side of the border. And therefore, if any Truth and Reconciliation Commission is set up, it will have to have an equal support from the government of India and the government of Pakistan. And therefore, I hope one day uh, these two countries can, can see it uh, uh, see fit to actually give the people of Jammu Kashmir the answers to these questions that have arisen over the last 20, 25 years. I think then we can lay to rest some of the ghosts and, and start healing some of the wounds that have festered for the last 20, uh, 25 years. All, I mean, there's hardly a family that has not been touched by violence. Uh, my family, uh, right from, from, from close relatives to political workers to neighbors to friends, there isn't a family that hasn't had uh, a loss on account of this violence. And honestly, that's why I said, I mean, it's an honor to be here. But the fact that 25 years later we're still discussing Kashmir is a matter of I mean, considerable disappointment and regret because I really had hoped uh, that this problem would have finished a long time ago. If in 1990 you had told people in Jammu and Kashmir that 25 years from now, we would still be discussing militancy and terrorism and violence. I think most people would have turned suicide with just the thought that 25 years and life would still be pretty much overshadowed by all this trouble. So I do hope that, that in, the, in, the, in the next few years, you have a government in, in Delhi that has a majority all of its own. It's not dependent on, on small musical local political parties. It can look at the broader national interest. Perhaps Prime Minister Modi wants to do what no other Prime Minister has done before uh, and, and resolve an issue that has foxed all came before him. And uh, if he does, great. 
I'll be more than happy to do whatever little I can to help the process along. And I hope he finds a meaningful counterpart uh, in, in Pakistan to help the process along. For the international community, I just hope that they recognize that Jammu and Kashmir is not an issue in which mediation is going to work. Uh, every time an international power has felt that they can mediate uh, this dispute or this problem, the doors have been slammed so fast uh, to take your breath away. Uh, sure, uh, a certain amount of back channel facilitation uh, always helps, but nothing more than that. So I do hope that the international community will play fair. Let India and Pakistan uh, talk amongst themselves. Don't continue to look at Jammu and Kashmir as, as I said, the most dangerous place in the world. It isn't. It certainly is one of the most beautiful places in the world. It isn't one of the most dangerous places. And I hope a time will come when, if I do get invited to Georgetown, it's about anything else but Jammu and Kashmir. But for this opportunity, uh, I'm extremely grateful. And thank you all very much. Very much. I have to say, uh, it's a breath of fresh air to hear a politician speak so forthrightly and uh, with such perspective on the, such a set of issues. So, with that, I'm going to take the liberty of asking and pushing you on some of the things you brought up, and then I'm sure our audience uh, will have any number of other questions. So, let's start with the point you raised at the end about mediation. And understanding, of course, what you said about the failure of previous attempts at mediation and also the reluctance of the Indian government to accept any. One of the exciting moments that has occurred in this past day in DC has been the revitalization of the Indo-US relationship. And we've had these very high profile visits, both with Prime Minister Modi coming here in September, and of course President Obama being the Chief Guest of Republic Day. Given that the United States has been a long-standing ally, supporter, some might say enabler of Islamabad, I mean, it does strike me that the U.S. has a particular leverage, maybe, in helping uh, these conversations occur. So aside from mediation, what role do you see for the United States, for Secretary Kerry right now, in helping the conversation take go to the next step? As I said, uh, I mean, just the, the, the role of an honest broker, uh, the fact is that this is a problem that India and Pakistan have to resolve amongst themselves. And there is a huge degree of suspicion about any country that seems to be uh, sort, of, sort of expressing a greater degree of interest than they should. Uh, so yeah, I mean, if you can just continue to, to uh, press upon Pakistan, just to fulfill uh, the, the obligations and the commitments that they have made with regard to not using their territory uh, to support any sort of militancy or incursions, and at the same time, uh, convince the government of India to remain engaged uh, with Islamabad, uh, regardless of the attempts to derail the dialogue process. I think the rest has to be left to the two countries and, its, and their respective leadership to, to thrash things out and, and to arrive at some sort of amicable solution. So with that risk, leaving it to these governments, I mean, in some sense, the last election, the one uh, that, as I said, lost, it resulted in a coalition that none of us probably saw coming, especially given the rhetoric of the campaign that preceded it. So we have now this uh, coalition between the BDP and the BJP. And for the BJP, Ram Madhav was quoted in the Indian Express. I say this is symbolic because it showed that uh, the BJP can come to power in uh, Kashmir. Do you see the pressures that are likely to be on this coalition as being good for bringing Delhi to engage in the solution? Are you See the political imperatives of needing to solidify the base in general as, in fact, providing a disincentive to reconstruct. I don't think the base in Jammu is going to be uh, the problem. I think the problem is going to be the base of the BJP and the rest of the country. I think uh, a couple of forthcoming state elections are going to indicate just how much room to maneuver. Prime Minister Modi has on what are otherwise extremely ticklish issues. And there are two very crucial states that the BJP did rather well in in the, in the, in the parliament election. That's the state of Bihar and the state of Uttar Pradesh. Uh, I don't think beyond a point the BJP is a 
particularly worried about its base in, 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 in Jammu because at the end of the day it only contributes to two seats in parliament. So yes, while it's nice to symbolically be a part of the government in Jammu and Kashmir, if to be a part of the government in Jammu and Kashmir they have to sacrifice the broader base in the rest of the country, I don't think it's a deal they're going to want to do. So how much uh, traction they're able to get in, in, on issues like the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, reduction of the security force footprint, uh, dialogue with the separatists, issues that the PDP has tried to make their own, uh, I think will be largely determined by what happens in, in these couple of state elections. And if, as popular wisdom would suggest, uh, the graph of the BJP is not as healthy as, as they would like it to be, it doesn't bode well for so just to be to, to be explicit then, so if in the upcoming elections in Bihar and if BJP loses Bihar, I think they'll they whatever forward movement they would like to make on issues in Jammu and Kashmir will grind to a halt. Right. Uh, so with that, I mean, so one of the things that we saw just last night, for instance, was that uh, Mashar Dalam and uh, Malik were put into preventive detention after the killing of the alleged militant in Thra, where they were making their way there for protests. Now this comes after the release of Alam from uh, prison. So it should we be worried right now to the tensions of all this preventive detention of a downward spiral at this moment? Do you think? No, uh, I, I, I would caution against sort of uh, interpreting this one uh, re-detention as a sort of downward spiral. It's unfortunate that that youngster uh, has been shot I don't know the circumstances under which that incident took place, but uh, I know, having dealt with the state for six years, that these sort of detentions are not uh, normally longer than a few days and are largely done so that cooler heads can prevail and uh, there aren't any further uh, deaths as a result of, of uh, law and order disturbances and things like that. I have no doubt that in a couple of days at least Yasin Malik will definitely be out. Masad Alam probably as well. Um, let me just turn the conversation a little bit because, of course, the, the, your perspective as Chief Minister was broader than simply the conflict. So, talking about the domestic politics of Jammu Kashmir, the frequent natural disasters, the flooding, you mentioned in another conversation uh, the recurrent power shortages that the state faces. Uh, in your first in your remarks this evening you talked about hydroelectric power. Uh, do you do you know that lots of things need to come together to make that happen? Do you see are you optimistic that we're going to solve some of the more mundane governance issues that might have people in the I, I hope they do but I haven't seen much evidence of it so far. And I'm willing to give them a bit of a margin because uh, at the end of the day that state government has been elected for a six year term and they haven't even had six months yet. So I think it would be extremely unfair on my part to start extracting six years of, of work uh, within, let's say, six weeks. So uh, I'm, I, I'll, I'll give them that much of a margin on some of the larger issues that you mentioned, like power projects, including governance and things like that. But on the one issue in which I may find fault with the government of India, and that is the reluctance to part with money to help people rebuild their lives after the devastating floods. I mean, there is there is no easy way for me to explain just how bad those floods were. Uh, when I pass through areas of the city that are now dry, and I look at the markings on the wall as to how high the water levels were, I honestly have to pinch myself and ask myself, oh, am I dreaming uh, to see that this is the kind of water and destruction? It's, it, 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 uh, it, it, goes beyond anything that I can explain to you. And therefore, we were really looking towards the government of India to help financially with people rebuilding their lives. And that hasn't happened. I mean, you're talking about a Prime Minister who very uh, flamboyantly promised to underwrite the Pakistani uh, damage uh, when these floods broke out because they had a degree of flooding there. So he came to Sirinagar and he said, not only will we rebuild this side, but I'm happy to help the other side as well, and India will contribute to Pakistan's rebuilding. Well, I wish you'd contribute just to ours. Forget about the Pakistanis, because out of the 44,000 crores, I'm sorry, I have to resort to Indian figures, but out of the 44,000 crores that we've asked for, we haven't even got 4,000 crores as yet. 
economy. So that's the ratio in terms of how much money has been is required for rebuilding and how much is actually come in. Uh, let me ask you one more question then. Uh, Mr. Abdul has agreed to take questions from the audience. We'll have a mic in the center aisle, and if you will line up uh, and ask your questions, we would love to hear them. Uh, when you do, please remember to introduce yourself so we know who we are talking to. Uh, but let me ask you one question before we turn it over to our audience. You've talked in your remarks, you, you talked explicitly about the return of the Kashmir Pandit population, and you talked about the townships. And, uh, I'm going to ask you to expand your thoughts a little bit because on the one hand, what he said was townships are probably not a great idea, and, but they need to know that they have the right to return. And I would argue that some might suggest that that's neither here nor there, that without a more explicit program that facilitates return. No, I'm, all, I'm, I'm all for facilitating return. What does that mean? Anything other than the sort of, as I, as I said, the ghettoization. Of, of Kashmiri Pandits. Look, they will, I mean, they, even in the past, before the militancy, you had areas where they were, I mean, there were more Kashmiri Pandits than Muslims. I mean, there were areas in Srinagar, Habakada being one of them, uh, there are other areas that I could name here, where, which were predominantly Kashmiri Pandits. But they had other communities living there as well. And they weren't fenced off, walled off, they weren't like any kind like controlments. Uh, they were towns in which people naturally gravitated towards with a commonality of interest and background. That is what we would like to see. I'd like to see Kashmiri pundits come back. By all means, you'll have a cluster of 10, 15 Kashmiri pundits homes. But I'd like to see those homes without a wall around them. I'd like to see them sort of in with the freedom to, to move around. I'd like to see their neighbors being able to, to come and visit them. I mean, the last thing I want is for this sort of walled enclosure where Kashmiri pundits live, where for anybody else to come and visit them, you have to like stand and, and, and wait to be let through this massive set of locked doors and gates and stuff like that, which is what will happen. If you bring them into one place, put a wall around them and say, look, these are Kashmiri pundits, this is where they live, you are unfortunately creating for those people who don't want to see their return. And, and that's what I want to guard against. So please, I mean, don't mistake my reluctance to, to support townships as a reluctance to support the return of the Kashmiri Pandits. I've always been very vocal in terms of how I'd like to see them come back. And, and I mean, obviously, uh, they need to be sort of, it, it needs to be financially uh, made, uh, how do I put this? Uh, they lost everything. And therefore, I think the onus is on us to make sure that Financially, the package is, is viable enough to facilitate their return. Uh, that hasn't happened so far. But on the on the on the gap thing, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, that's not something that I can see myself supporting. Do we have any questions? Um, uh, my name is Omar Kondro, also Omar, I'm also Kashmiri. So, um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for coming here to speak with both of us. I think it's unfortunately something that's not really heavily discussed in the States. So, it's an important issue that thankfully events like this will help uh, hopefully in the future inform more Americans about this issue. So, my question is In September 2009, a London based think tank called Chatham House conducted a survey in the Kashmir, both sides of, uh, both sides of the line of control. At asking Kashmiri specifically what they would prefer if a plebiscite was would offer, uh, what were offered, and what they found was that specifically in the Kashmir Valley, approximately anywhere from 78 to 98 percent, depending on the district of Kashmir, of the part of Kashmir, um, said that they would prefer not to join India if a plebiscite was offered, and that they would actually, and even less, fewer people would prefer to join Pakistan. And for the overwhelming majority of Kashmiris, they said that they would prefer, if possible, to become an independent nation themselves. So my question is, um, as you mentioned earlier, that the, your, uh, your party specifically, the National Conference, and other uh, similar parties, they prefer to approach the Kashmir issue as one within the context of uh, being under the Indian Union. How can uh, your party, as well as other parties, claim to represent the voice of Kashmiris and claim to represent uh, Kashmiri people if they fundamentally don't uh, agree on this very like basic issue of whether or not 
they, uh, whether or not Kashmir should be part of India, whether or not they should be part of Pakistan, or has the, the overall majority of people seem to think as an independent state. Well, I mean, I, I, I take the point you're making. But the thing is that that isn't going to change. Uh, as much as the people in Jammu Kashmir would like to believe that their views are going to be sought and they're going to be asked which side they're going to want to go, that's not going to happen. Uh, and therefore, while I don't claim to represent the basic aspiration of the majority of the people of Jammu and Kashmir, I do represent a certain thought process. And that thought process does come forward in every single election and participate. So while the person coming out and voting may at the back of their mind have a fundamental desire to be free, they also have a desire to be represented by a government where their views are taken on board and where they receive uh, some amount of, of, of governance and, and some amount of redressal of their problems. And, and, and that's, I, I, I accept that it's a contradiction in terms, but that's the way it is. It's, 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 it's what makes Jammu and Kashmir an extremely difficult state to do politics in. Because yes, there is that fundamental reality that you're talking about. But there is also the, the, the extended reality, the people who would have given Chatham House their views were the same people who in the last election came out in 70%, 80% plus and actually participated in an election where there wasn't a single allegation of coercion. They came with their own free will, they stood in line, they voted and they put a government in place. So the people of Jammu and Kashmir themselves are able to reconcile this basic yearning with the reality, and the reality is that they vote for elections, they put a government into place, and they hope that that government will deliver on its promises. And I'm that I represent that part of the, that aspiration, the aspiration for governance. The Hurriyat Conference represents the other aspiration, which is the aspiration for a solution that lies outside the 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 the, 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 the four walls of the Constitution of India. And so far, at least in, in, in the political context, it, it seems to work. Khan and I'm from India occupied Kashmir. Uh, my question to you just I saw sort of a conflict. You said that, for example, if Mr. Modi loses Delhi election and the process of talks between on Kashmir between India and Pakistan will come to a driving halt. So and you also said that I don't recall saying that. I said Bihar and I talked okay. about and I talked about governance issues. I didn't talk about India, Pakistan. So and you also said, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, that in the beginning, that there's more Kashmiri talk in Indian elections than Pakistanis. Actually, one, the of the reasons, yeah, one of the reasons why Modi was like, one, maybe not the only reason, major reason, but how much anti-virulently anti-Pakistani he is. With this kind of stance, how do you think mere excuses, they are not even foreign secretary level of talks going on between India and Pakistan, without international mediation, how do you think it will? I'm sure, Mr. Abdullah, you'll come after 50 years and you'll be still talking about Kashmir if there is no international mediation. And second, the original question is that you yourself said in many speeches in Kashmir that they didn't elect me because I was popular or they didn't elect me to say why he was popular. These were bread and butter issues, why they wanted somebody to take care of the road. No, real leader is Gilani Sahab, uh, uh, Yasin Malik Sahab. And to them, your solution will not be acceptable. Say, if you fight an election against Gilani's party, you will... Is, is there a question in there? Yeah, there's a question in that. Is it is. In your speech, and you're welcome to it. I haven't heard a single question. No, I have a solution. My question is that solution you are proposing. Yeah. These solutions are not working. Again, it's not a question. So what are you doing? <laughs> So what do you think? About I told you what I think. And what I think hasn't changed just because I've heard what you've had to say. I respect your views and uh, you're welcome to them. And I find uh, there is a greater stridency in these sort of views the further you are away from Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, the stronger the American accent amongst the Kashmiri population is here the more freedom they want for Jammu and Kashmir because they're that much further away from it.
more respect for these views when they come to me from people who actually live in Kashmir. And therefore, you so, 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 I, I, heard, I heard what you had to say. I have no problem when it's Gilani Saab that is saying this to me, or Yasin Malik that is saying this to me, or others that are saying this to me. I'm a little reluctant to accept the pontification when it comes here in, in, in Washington. We'll have this argument when you come to Srinagar anytime you like. And yet, here you are listening to me. Um, my name is Amanda Zhu, and um, I'm the sophomore here. <laughs> I really don't have any connection to Kashmir, but I wanted to thank you for coming and speaking with us. Um, your proposal for a Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission is a very welcome one, um, in my opinion. Um, I just wanted to ask, obviously, uh, there needs to be government support from both India and Pakistan for this, but doesn't the initiative have to come from within the state, given the inter-race, uh, interracial, and inter-religious conflicts in the state? Doesn't uh, such a committee, uh, commission have to be internal from the state itself? Well, it would be, as I said, if it was to be confined only to either the Indian side of Jammu and Kashmir or the Pakistani side of Jammu and Kashmir. But this Truth and Reconciliation Commission, should it come into existence, has to straddle both sides. And therefore, as much as uh, I or, or Mufti Sayyid or, or uh, any other elected Chief Minister from Jammu and Kashmir was to espouse this, uh, it would, as I said, really have to come as a result of uh, an initiative taken by India and Pakistan to answer the questions. Because they are really the bigger player in this. They are the ones that have a lot more to answer for. What, how do you think such government support can come about? Or what can be done to promote your proposal, which I think is wonderful? Oh, well, obviously, I mean, the only thing we can do is to keep talking about it and to try and convince uh, the powers that be uh, that this is the right way forward. I mean, more often than not, when I talk about a, a, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission for, for Jammu and Kashmir, it's not that somebody says it's a bad idea or it shouldn't happen. What I'm often told is that a Truth and Reconciliation Commission is a post-conflict uh, initiative. And since Jammu and Kashmir is still, quote unquote, a conflict zone, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission would be meaningless. Uh, so it's, it's almost as if they say, well, okay, fine, yes, it's, it's something we'll look at only when the last gun has fallen silent. To which my point is that, look, if you wait that long, then God knows how long you'll be waiting. So there is some talk about it, but uh, very, very informal, and uh, it hasn't, as I said, got the sort of traction that one would like it to have, but I do hope it does happen. Thank you. Let's try and keep our questions short. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my accent is not American, so uh, well, I'm from Kashmir. Uh, PhD student at George Washington University, uh, my name is Asker. Uh, so thanks for coming here and speaking to us. Uh, uh, you spoke about historical logic and what happened uh, over the course of decades and how we get into to democracy. I don't want to go into counterfactuals, even though that's important for us and to better. Uh, my question is more substantive. You spoke about human rights also, but you spoke little about what happened under your administration. Uh, some broad points should be on the uh, 2009-2010, hundreds of kids killed. My question is, is, does that happen repeatedly even though I was reading the Express on the way to the end? And the boy killed was not militant, he was militant's brother. So it seems like he has been killed in the custody because the, the report said there were no blood marks on his body. <coughs> uh, my question, does that happen because your executive authority is paid limited? and it's trumped by military and uh, central government, or there are other reasons to why this cycle happens again and again. Because then you give people a lot of resentment, and being a local and grew up through the 90s, 2000s, then, uh, it gives us a reason to keep on fighting. So I agree with you. Yeah. Any incident like this is a huge setback. As I said, uh, when, I was, when I made reference to the most recent one, I don't know the circumstances under which that happened. And therefore, for me to sit here and, and, and uh, to take uh, 
position on that one way or the other would be wrong. But yes, I, I, I fully, uh, I, I take the point and, and I've never shied away from that, that uh, summers like the summer of 2010 uh, are hugely detrimental to the interests of, of Jammu and Kashmir in terms of, of uh, uh, cementing a degree of normality and, and giving people a, a, a sense of security and a sense of, of, uh, of confidence in the situation. And uh, the fact that that happened during my government is something that I will always uh, personally have a huge amount of regret for. Uh, it was not something that was, was planned for. It was an extremely difficult situation to deal with. And uh, uh, I dare say one of the main reasons why I'm not talking to you as Chief Minister today is because I had to stay the state through that, that, that uh, traumatic summer of 2010. On Shupanya, uh, we can agree to disagree because uh, you will never believe what I have to say and therefore that's best left untouched. But your, your fundamental point is that uh, why do these things happen? Yeah, your point of view is your executive authority to prevent, say, for example, what happened in Andhra Pradesh, paramilitary in 20 wood cutters. Sorry, what happened in? Andhra Pradesh, that paramilitary yeah. forces shot down 20 unarmed wood cutters. So you can't. That is a that is an issue of serious state Look, I, don't, I don't know, I don't know whether the whether the state government in Andhra Pradesh was actually looking for that incident or not. So again, it wouldn't be right on my part uh, to to extrapolate what happened in Andhra Pradesh and, and link it to what happens in Jammu and Kashmir, except to say that, look, that's why we are talking about the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, because it does reduce the power of the executive to drive accountability. And the fact that civil courts have no jurisdiction over the misuse of force. Let's take, for example, I mean, just take the, the Grand Incident. Hypothetically speaking, let's assume that what you read in the newspaper is correct and that the boy was not a militant, he was a militant's brother and that he was killed as a result of the excessive use of force. The problem will be that because of the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, you will not be able to try him under a civil court. See, on the, on the summer of 2010, cases have been registered in all the deaths that occurred as a result of the state police, because that was something that we could do. But the deaths that have occurred as a result of the secure, central security forces are covered under the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. And therefore, your ability to drive justice from civil courts is limited by this Armed Forces Special Powers Act. That's why we've been talking about removing it, and in places where you can't remove it, dilute it. My government was the one that diluted the Public Safety Act to make it less draconian than it was. And I think the same is necessary for the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. Again, let's try to keep our question short and one question. My name is Krishna Murthy. I'm from one of the three states that you referred to, the state of Hyderabad, which then became Andhra Pradesh. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you very much for a very clearly articulated speech of yours, um, something that I was not really expecting from a politician. I'm glad I was able to surprise you. But my substantive question has to do with a one of the things that you were not willing to turn back to compare to the many other things like the line of control and other things that you were willing to, to kind of accept. And that has to do with the special status that you would like to preserve for Jammu and Kashmir. As a part of the rest of India, how do you sell this to them and what are those parts that, that, that you are interested in as the special things which would not make the rest of India feel like a seller? No, why would it be a sellout? I mean, Jammu and Kashmir acceded to the Union of India on the back of that agreement which limited the Union's power to those four areas. I mean, please understand, as I said, I mean, the state of Jammu and Kashmir has actually got a raw deal because it has continued to remain steadfast a part of the Union. But the conditions on which that accession took place have been, have been, have been systematically and substantially eroded. And that is why we make the point that, look, if Jammu and Kashmir exceeded and didn't merge, that special status has to be respected, it has to be restored. Now, what are those areas that you are willing to look at? What are the, what are the aspects that you want restored? That's a part of the discussion. That's a part of the negotiation. 
I'm hardly likely to place all my cards on the table here and say, look, this is what we'll accept and this is what we won't. I've, as it is, probably gone further than my party would have wanted me to do by saying that, look, let's not bring the Supreme Court, the Election Commission, the Controller and Auditor General, the Indian Administrative Services, the Indian Police Services and all of those into the mix. Those are there, there for the good of the state. But there are other areas that we can discuss. That include the movement of people from the rest of India into Jammu and Kashmir? See, I'm glad you brought this up because the movement of people into Jammu and Kashmir has nothing to do with Article 370 or accession. No, I, I, I'm sorry that I didn't remember to touch on this because I didn't know how, how focused I should get on, on localized issues. The inability of people from the rest of India to buy land in Jammu and Kashmir has nothing to do with accession. You'll be surprised. This law actually predates 1947. It was established by the Maharaja in the early 1900s at the request of the people of Jammu because they were worried that the rich Punjabis were going to move in and buy up large parts of Jammu. It had nothing to do with Kashmir. This was actually the Maharaja looking to protect the people of Jammu. Over time, it has, it has assumed its own importance and I see no reason why you should mix the two. Jammu and Kashmir's accession, Article 370, the special status of Jammu and Kashmir is one thing. The state subject laws are entirely the domain of the state. I think that's something that we can work out internally ourselves. We have time for two more questions. And I I'll try to keep my answer short. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, so, uh, I hope I'll make this quick. So, Okay, um, so I thought that one of the most applaudable things that you did during your campaign was you actually uh, put up your personal email to ask people feedback on what they wanted. Um, and I think you make yourself a lot more available than most Indian politicians do. Working in Delhi and trying to get in contact with Indian politicians, I know how difficult it is. Um, so I was just wondering though, after six years or over six years of working um, in Kashmir, did that really open you up to anything new? Was there anything that you saw or that anybody said that you were like, I've never thought about this before? Well, not in terms of the wider political perspective, but yes, in terms of the impact of some of our governance decisions and how they uh, were, how, I mean, how we had intended them and how uh, the voters uh, sort of misunderstood them. There was a wide gap between what we wanted to do and how it was perceived. And therefore, I had to roll back a couple of initiatives that we'd taken on recruitment, on, on salaries, on things like that, based on the feedback that I got by opening up my email. It was a different matter that I was completely swamped. And I had no idea what I was letting myself in for. And long after I had committed office, I was still sifting through emails that had been written to me as chief minister. But uh, no, it was a very useful exercise. Uh, it's, you know, it's a very tricky one because on the one hand, they want their politicians to be more accessible, more available. Uh, but then they also want to use the opportunity to free flow the abuse <laughs> and uh, it's, it, after a while it becomes very difficult. I mean, I love being on Twitter, but there is a time when I just have to stop looking at my timeline because the gentleman after speaking has walked off. But there are a number of people like him. He was actually very polite. Uh, <laughs> I, had, I had so much worse on my timeline uh, that it becomes very difficult. So it's, it's a tricky balance between being available and then having to deal with that sort of feedback and fallout. Thank you so much for being here, sir. My name is Madeline Cesado. I'm a sophomore in the School of Foreign Service, and I'm here on behalf of the Georgetown University of Carabao. Um, my one question for you is about economic development. You mentioned earlier the possibility of a hydroelectric plant or hydroelectric power and how this would rely on investment India, but simultaneously that India can also be very preoccupied with other domestic and international concerns. So my question then is, what is Plan B? No, in this case, I don't think we can have a Plan B, because there really is no other resource that we can tap into. Uh, tourism is 
has, has always been the mainstay of the economy in Jammu and Kashmir, but tourism is very fickle. Uh, you'll have a good year in terms of a tourist season. There'll be one Sunday incident in Sunday or over there. Uh, I'll take this season, for example. Uh, we had bookings where our hotels were going to be full for April and May. And then we had heavy rain in March. There was the fear of floods, and suddenly I had 90% cancellation of the So yes, while we look at tourism and other areas, most of the economic economic activity is not taxed in Jammu and Kashmir. I was telling Irfan and others yesterday that the five largest items of JNK's economy, tourism, agriculture, horticulture, handicrafts, and industry, none of these activities are taxed. So there is very little resource generation happening within the state, and that's where hydroelectricity comes in. We have conservatively estimated the capacity in our rivers of more than 22,000 megawatts in run of the river hydroelectric projects. If I can tap in even 50% of this, even 50% is a lot. If I can generate 8,000 megawatts of electricity, my peak requirement in Jammu Kashmir is about four, four, four and a half thousand megawatts, which means I have a good four and a half, five thousand megawatts surplus electricity to sell. My advantage is that my peak, peak generation is in summer, which is peak demand for the rest of the country. It's a win-win situation for me. I generate the electricity, it's available at peak times, the rest of the country buys it, and I use that to cross-subsidize other aspects of my economy. I wish I had a plan B, but given that I have no coal, no oil, no gas, no any other resources, it's, it's either the rivers or unfortunately nothing much else. Thank you. Uh, let me make a suggestion. If each of you could ask your question. And then I'll answer. <coughs> and you can get your question. Hi, my name is Jason Shaw. Thank you for coming. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the, status, the current status of the dock and whether the so dock. The, the current status of the dock okay. and whether the, the docky people could benefit from, from greater autonomy from the Kashmir Valley and Jammu or a possible complete separation from the state. Okay, that's uh, my question was given the nationalist bent of the current Indian government and the ISI in Pakistan, do you think a conflict in Kashmir could ever escalate to a nuclear exchange? And how would the Indian side react if Pakistan launched the first nuclear weapon? How would India react if Pakistan launched the nuclear weapon? I think we're pretty clear on that. <laughs> Thank you very much for taking me about the audience questions. Highly adapted. So I would like to ask you, you said you want to change the line of control in the international borders. In the, the deep state of Pakistan, for the deep state of Pakistan, jihad in Kashmir is a subset of Ghazwai Hind. They believe in uh, Ghazwai Hind. In that, uh, in that, how does that mean? Ghazwai Hind means uh, uh, war against entire India as okay. part of the right. subset. Uh, number one, when the, if you, if you, uh, how is that going to work out in that backdrop? And number two, why did you fail? to bring back the Kashmiri Pandits. Okay. Uh, my name is Pradeep Kapoor. I was ambassador of India to countries like Cambodia and Chile and secretary of the GOI government of India. I am now professor at the University of Maryland. As also while in service, professor at the Georgetown University in the School of Foreign Service, where I organized the first conference on India and China at that time in 1992 which was the first time such an event had occurred. And where Kashmir came up prominently also naturally, <laughs> as you said, it's been continuing. My question to you is if we reflect upon Kashmir in a holistic way from 1947 to 2015, uh, on one particular aspect which has not been touched upon, on the extent of corruption which is there in Kashmir, within all the different uh, domains, whether it's the bureaucracy, whether it's the politics, whether it's the business, whether it's the police, whatever it is. Suppose this component was not so extensive, of which I've known a lot even from my own personal experiences. Uh, would it have been a different Kashmir today in the Indian part of Kashmir Sorry, or uh, in the Pakistan? Let me just let me try and understand. You're suggesting that the resentment and the problem is in large parts contributed 
to buy the corruption. Uh, well, no. In a way, partly that is a question, but I am also asking... So you are asking me if the corruption wasn't there, would the Kashmir problem be as... as Sort of, uh, as severe as, as severe it is today as it is. in okay. India and Pakistan, right, in both the sides. Okay. And whether that would have probably shown some light of hope at the end okay. of the tunnel for the solution. Right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good evening. Thank you so much. I'm mean, uh, simply amazed with the rationality of thoughts. Uh, just a quick comment actually, would you like to comment more about uh, your grandfather's relationship with uh, the Maharaja and the, simulat the similarities and differences they had? Oh gosh, yeah. <laughs> I'll start with that one because it's the easiest. I really don't know. Uh, how, I, honestly, I, I wish I did, but my grandfather passed away before my interest in politics had even begun to sort of show itself. And therefore, I deprived myself of the opportunity to actually sit down with my grandfather and ask him something like this. This actually would have been a question that my father would perhaps have been better place to answer. I, 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 I wish I could, but I can't. So maybe if we meet at a future point in time, I might have a better answer for you. Okay, now some of the issues that were touched upon. Uh, Ladakh. Ladakh, again, is, is one of those uh, sort of contradictions in terms. Uh, the first uh, young man who asked me talked about the aspirations of Jammu and Kashmir, Kashmiris for a solution outside of, of uh, the country and, and the rest of it. Ladakh is, is, is in some ways similar, except that they're not looking for a solution outside of the constitution or outside of India, but they look for a state outside of Jammu and Kashmir, but yet are quite happy to participate in our elections, quite happy to be sort of uh, involved in, in decision making, governance and things like that. Uh, whether they will get a state or not, I don't know. I hope they don't because uh, Jammu and Kashmir is sort of uh, biggest uh, advantage is the sort of pluralistic state that we have notwithstanding the problems of the last 20-25 years. On the nuclear question, what will India do? I think it's very obvious. But I think it's also I think it's also I think it's also greater minds than mine are sitting here. Uh, and uh, you will often hear it said that nuclear powers don't go to war with each other. Uh, it's it's never been known to happen and I don't think it ever will be known to happen. Uh, and therefore I, I, I hope that we are never proven wrong and that those weapons are used as a deterrent and not uh, for something that they're going to put into use. Uh, was there another question with that? I think that was the only one, wasn't it? Then there was, uh, why did I fail to bring uh, the Kashmiri Pandits back? Uh, I think we, 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 uh, it was work in progress with the government of India. A symbolic start was made a couple of thousand young Kashmiri funded boys and girls came back to the state, came back to the valley, took up government jobs there. The large number of them have stayed on, are working there, have brought their family members back. The second stage of assimilating them back into, into, uh, into the, the wider sort of countryside has been hampered by uh, the absence of a suitable financial package wherein they can rebuild their lives uh, rebuild their homes, uh, rebuild their livelihoods, and, and that is that was work in progress during my government with Dr. Manmohan Singh's government, and then subsequently with Prime Minister Modi's government. I hope that uh, my successor does take this this initiative forward. I know that there are going to be differences of opinion because the BJP, uh, from the statements of the Home Minister, seem to be keen to take this township uh, concept forward. Uh, I don't think it's going to work, uh, but uh, we'll have to wait and see. Corruption, well, yes, I mean, corruption is a problem in Jammu and Kashmir, but in that respect, Jammu and Kashmir is not unique. Uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, sort of uh, uh, trying to be flippant here uh, or, or suggest that that is not an issue that needs to be taken seriously. It, it is, and, and it should be. And my government did uh, try and put into place in, uh, uh, institutional mechanisms to reduce the levels of corruption. Uh, we brought in the, the Transparency, the Right to Information Act uh, to make government more transparent. 
We rely more on electronic uh, tendering, e-tendering and e-bidding for government procurement and government services. We brought in a new uh, corruption uh, watchdog called the Accountability Commission and the, the, uh, the uh, Anyway, these are, these are, these are. The reason, thank you very much, Dr. Sivar. It's always good to have somebody who's well versed in what's happening in Kashmir because when I get stuck, somebody is there to help me out. Yeah, the Vigilance Commission. Uh, but, you know, would militancy have been as strong as it was if there wasn't corruption? I think the answer to that lies in the makeup of, of militants in, in Jammu and Kashmir. If the militants were all 100% Kashmiri, I would say that yes, perhaps corruption is also an issue and governance is an issue. But the majority of militants in Jammu and Kashmir today are non Kashmiri. Uh, at last count, and my information now could be a little dated, we've had about 17 or 18 different nationalities of militants who have been caught or killed in Jammu and Kashmir. So you had Sudanese, you had Bosnians, you had Chechnyans, you had of course the Afghans and the Pakistanis, you had people from the United Kingdom and, and uh, elsewhere. Uh, and I'm sure they're not there because Kashmir is, is, is a corrupt place. Uh, it's more than that. Uh, so corruption is an issue that, that bothers people in their day-to-day -day lives. It's, it's I think another my government uh, faced the, the, the drubbing that we did in the elections, uh, but it's, I, I don't think it's an issue for, for militancy. On the question of whether the, if the line of control has made the border, what will the Pakistani army do? Well, that's the million dollar question. Uh, I mean, the fact is that the, 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 and, and this is something that was discussed in the session prior to mine. I don't think Christine is here, otherwise she would be far better place to answer this question in, in much better terms uh, than I could if she was here. Honestly, if she was here, I would step down into the audience and, and let her take this because she has a, a, a completely different theory on that and, and uh, that would suggest that yes, even if you did convert the line of control into the border, the Pakistani army would play a lot, which is why I said that it's not going to be an easy solution to sell, but logically, I can't think of any other solution that can even begin to work. Uh, and if somebody else can propose one, I'm more than happy to, to, to change my, my point of view and, and uh, go along with whatever that one is that's being accepted. But until that happens, I'll stand firm on what I believe is, is the way forward and hope that uh, we get there. As you can see uh, very clearly from this conversation, this is a Twitter account you should follow. <laughs> the yes, I'm, I'm hoping to cross the million mark. Uh, <laughs> I, I've kind of hovered now at about 890,000. So if you guys can help me drum up another 110,000, I'll be very grateful. We honor that we are the first U.S. University. I'm sure there are many more. But I hope you always think of Georgetown as your home in America and Washington, D.C. We hope you come back many times and we hope we talk about lots of things beyond the generation. Well, thank Thanks. you very much. Thank you.